Hi, welcome back to the breadboard. Do you recognize what this is? If your answer is no, then you probably need to subscribe to my channel and to DesignSpark and pay attention to what's going on in the industrial IoT space. Um, this is an IoT 2000. This specific one is an IoT 2020. Um, I do have an IoT 2040 on here as well. Uh, the main difference is being one of them has a single Ethernet and no serial ports and the 2040 has two serial ports and two Ethernets. Aside from that, the only real difference is that the 2040 is aimed more at directly the industrial market and has a battery in to maintain a real-time clock. The 2020 is more aimed at educational markets, does not have the battery in, but you can add one if you want to. Uh, and is uh, half a gig of RAM versus one gig of RAM. So outside of that, the two units are pretty much the same. So what are they? They're a Intel Core 1000 series CPU running at about a gigahertz. Um, as I already said, one has a gig of RAM, one has a half a gig of RAM. They have an Arduino compatible header on them. If I just pull one apart here. I can show you. So this is the IoT 2020, and we've got Arduino compatible R3 headers. You've got the Quark 1000 processor, Ethernet port on the, I'm upside down here, on the top, and you've got two USB ports um, on the top as well, over here. <laughs> Um, and on the back, you've got a PCI Express slot for things like um, Intel Wi-Fi Bluetooth board or other things that you could put in there. And so both of these boards, the 2020 and the 2040, they're aimed at being an IoT gateway. Now, my question to you is, first of all, what is an IoT gateway, right? Um, and what do they the gateways connect to. If you understand one, you probably understand the answer to the other one. So I'm going to show you some other devices and then pose a kind of question to you. All right. This is a Raspberry Pi Model 3. It has a quad-core processor, uh, Giga RAM, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, etc., etc. Okay. Very, very popular in the educational market. This is an Arduino Uno R3. Again, very popular in the educational market and amongst hobbyists. It has uh, nowhere near that much RAM. <laughs> it's gone out of the top of my head right now. Anyway, it, it's got um, very little memory in it. It's got E-squared PROM for storage, and it only runs at 16 megahertz, not 1 gigahertz. Um, these are used for um, control applications where timing is very, very critical and you need to be able to maintain that. But predominantly it's single threaded, although you can do some rudimentary round robin kind of threading if you really want to. Then I've got something like this, which is an Raspberry Pi Zero with Wi-Fi. Now there's one without Wi-Fi as well. Um, so knowing and understanding all of those devices, I guess I've also got a launch pad as well from TI, which is effectively the equivalent of the Arduino Uno and Arduino range as well, but from Texas Instruments versus using Atmel chips. But the, my question, getting back to that, is what is the gateway? What is it equivalent to? Given all of those devices, what do you think it is equivalent to? Is it equivalent to an Arduino? Is it equivalent to a Raspberry Pi? Um, a combination of them, because it has a one gigahertz um, processor, a CPU, not a, uh, it's not a microcontroller, it's an actual CPU, and it has a half a gig of RAM, so a little bit less than the uh, uh, Raspberry Pi Model 3s, but the same as what's in the Raspberry Pi Zero, for example. Um, it runs at a gigahertz, so way, way faster than an Arduino, but it also has an Arduino R3 compatible header on for putting uh, shields and things like that on there. So what is it equivalent to? If you ever think about that, I don't know whether you have an answer in your head yet or not. My view is it's probably the equivalent of the Raspberry Pi Zero, because that from a uh, Unix Linux perspective is about the same. So they're both running a gigahertz processor. They're both single core. They're both got half a gig of memory. This one happens to have Wi-Fi on it as well. 
Um, but aside from that, you know, it's, it's roughly the same. And it's got some GPIO um, on here as well. Whereas the IoT 2020 and 2040 also has an Arduino Uno header, just like the Arduino is exactly the same kind of header as this, same pinout, and can be the same logic levels as well. There's actually a jumper, so you can switch between 3.3 and 5 volts. So it's got the capabilities of this too, but it doesn't run at 16 megahertz, it actually runs at a gigahertz, so way, way faster. So I think it's the combination of the Raspberry Pi model a a I think it's a combination of the Raspberry Pi Zero without Wi-Fi and the Arduino Uno R3. And the reason for that is because you can run Arduino sketches. You can take an Arduino sketch that I've written for this that could have a relay shield on it, an RS485 shield, an LCD display shield using the SPI um, bus as well for displays and things. You've got uh, analog inputs, digital outputs, pulse width modulation outputs, and all of those are available on the IoT 2020 and 2040 as well. But it's not really aimed at being what I would call an edge device. These kind of devices, like an Arduino Uno um, or ESP8266s, which I've got an example of here, um, like this, which is an ESP8266 with a relay, it's designed to work on mains. So there's a little um, mains to 5 volt. Uh, sorry, to 3.3 volt power supply built into it, uh, and it can communicate over Wi-Fi, but it's got very little intelligence. You can actually program it and see and everything, um, but it connects through Wi-Fi. It's got a built-in antenna, but it really doesn't do too much for you. It turns a relay on and off, and you could maybe add a temperature sensor and a humidity sensor or something, but very, very limited functionality and not a lot of business logic. Now, you could put some limited things in there, but you really wouldn't want to. This is designed for going out on the edge of your um, network, logically speaking, and uh, making sensor readings, whether that's monitoring a conveyor system in some kind of manufacturing plant, or acting as a little weather station somewhere, or an internal humidity control system somewhere. And it's then relaying that data back to a more advanced, more powerful system to do the control. Whereas you know, an Arduino Uno, is based on the 80 mega 328 CPU, and that's an you know that, that's another microcontroller similar to the ESP8266 in its um, performance and capabilities for I/O and things like that. It just doesn't have built-in Wi-Fi, but is also very popular outside of the Arduino Uno uh, as a microcontroller for industrial um, devices and things like that for sensing and edge devices and running um, small devices. Uh, in the likes. It's not a high power doing a whole bunch of mathematic, you know, uh, floating point operations or anything like that. It can't really do that and it's not really what it's aimed for. But you can run, for example, a CNC from one of these. You can give it basic instructions, go to these coordinates, um, make some stepper motors uh, operate together to carve a circle out of a piece of wood or plastic or something like that, right? It's, it's very capable for doing something like that. And if you look at my CNC videos, um, you will see that I actually have an Arduino Uno doing just that. If you gave it a, an STL file or something like that higher level and told it to do something with it, it wouldn't have a clue. It doesn't have enough memory, doesn't have enough of anything to do that, right? So it's more, as I said, as an edge device. Um, limited functionality device. And when you look at things like IoT, uh, the Internet of Things, it's all about having s little uh, low-cost devices scattered everywhere that can sense and control a limited number of things without too much intelligence, but they can report back their status via wireless, via serial, or something like that. I ideally, because it's Internet of Things, normally it's via either a wired or wireless connection, but using uh, TCP IP protocols. Uh, so that's kind of like one of the, con the requirements for being an IoT device is that it can, if you really wanted it to, participate on the internet, which means it needs to be able to use IP. But they don't have to have a lot of intelligence. They could, but they don't have to, and normally they wouldn't. So if you've got a bunch of these and you want to control the data um, that goes out onto the internet or to some big data storage somewhere, whether that's in-house, uh, remote from the location that you're monitoring or something like that. How do you do that? You, know, you could program every single one of these things, whether you, know, you put a Wi-Fi shield or an Ethernet shield on an Arduino 
or you know an ESP8266 if you've got a Wi-Fi hotspot nearby could use that you could put some cell phone shields on a thing but then there's you've got all of these different devices all trying to communicate on the network uh, or on the cellular network and things and that can get expensive and it can get complicated and really you don't need it and what you would typically do is you as you would use a gateway um, to do that and that's where things like the IoT to, uh, 2000 series, the 2020 and the 2040, come in. These are relatively inexpensive. The IoT 2020, as an educational platform, uh, is still fully industrial compliant, by the way, comes in at under 100 euros. I think it's about 79 euros or something like that. So it's ready to go in a uh, industrial enclosure. It takes 24 volts nominally as its power supply, although it can be anything from about 8 volts up to um, 36 volts for the power supply, but normally 24. Uh, it's got your you know, Ethernet built in already, and it's got a client and a host uh, USB port built in. And if you want to put a shield on here, you can to do some I.O. But right off the bat, it could actually sit there locally, and you could plug in a um, things like the Raspberry Pi um, approved Wi-Fi adapter will plug right in here, the official Raspberry Pi one, and it will just work right out of the box. I'm also using an Intel um, PCI Wi-Fi Bluetooth adapter on one of these, the one at the back with the antennas on the top here, right here. And that is, it sits in the back and you've got the antennas and it will quite happily communicate with a bunch of edge devices that have lower powered Wi-Fi um, things on them, or you could connect via the USB to a device, or you could even have something on the GPIO header um, sensing or communicating with things. Now, out of the box, this comes with CL, UL, and other certifications. But if you start adding your own boards to this, for instance, if you actually bought the um, Arduino official relay board or something like that, uh, for instance, this one here is currently sitting with the official Arduino um, four channel relay board on it. And I've got another one with, with a motor controller on. And if you put those in there, you officially break the CEUL certifications because as a complete product, it's not certified in that configuration. But when you put these out as a gateway, sometimes you may just have a, um, a, 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 a number of industrial um, plant equipment and maybe you're gonna be monitoring vibration, temperature, uh, even just some simple relays, are doors opened, are they closed, um, an over temperature alarm, a pressure alarm. Uh, you may want to just turn on and off a couple of relays, maybe for maintenance reasons. And it, you could even be using these for proactive um, maintenance by monitoring a certain number of parameters and having some computation being done in here, maybe a, a, quite a bit of business logic, and then uh, sending commands back to that uh, plant equipment or sending requests and data up to a higher level system that's far or more remote from one of these and have it um, then receive instructions. So how do you do all that? Well, first of all, this is going to be running Linux. It's designed to run Yocto Linux right now, although the, you know, the, the Quark 1000 processor can probably run a number of other um, OSs as well. But the one that Siemens provides and supports is the Yocto Linux on here. And it comes now with Node-RED, a SQLite 3 database, and MQTT capabilities all on here ready to go. You just have to turn them on or off through a configuration screen. And what that means for you is that this can actually aggregate a whole bunch of data with little to no programming uh, and make decisions as to what to do with those edge devices. So the edge devices themselves don't need to have uh, much intelligence. They just report their status and maybe react to some commands that might be sent. And the way I do this for a lot of my projects is I have all of these edge devices, uh, ESP 8266s, uh, Arduino UNs, and things like that. Uh, one of the first things I always put onto them is an MQTT client that then publishes to an MQTT broker which I actually run on one of these quite happily. And it does all the work about publishing and subscribing and managing the data flows between all interested parties. Now, the power of this, it has enough um, horsepower in there to also run something like Node-RED and maintain uh, a relatively uh, straightforward database. Remember, you're running off of an SD card, so you don't want to have too many 
um, read and writes to that SD card, but you can maintain a, a file-based database on here and have that uploaded maybe on a routine basis to some re remote location, or you can just use it for um, reporting, trending, and stuff like that on a web interface that can also be running on here. Uh, when you're using things like Node-RED, it sits on top of Node.js, which is a very popular Java-based um, environment for doing industrial control, home automation, and things like that. And because it's graphical and it hosts a web page, you can have a local UI, uh, which then allows you using a uh, a smartphone, a tablet, a PC from any location really, depends on how you set your network up, to interact with it and control what it's doing, set thresholds for alarms and things like that. Um, and if you've ever seen Node-RED, then you'll know that it's very easy to program and there are a huge number of libraries that allow you to do all sorts of protocols, you know, whether it be um, MQTT, of course, uh, talking to SQLite database, but also things like Modbus, um, Profinet is coming, um, and there's, there's just too many really to list, as well as integrating with uh, cloud-based services as well. Um, Azure um, from Microsoft, IBM's Watson, um, Amazon, the AWS, and Google's uh, cloud services, just to name a few. Um, most of them are based on uh, some kind of MQTT or um, web sockets kind of interface and you can push the data up there. A lot of them have APIs ready to run under Linux. Um, so it's just a case of downloading it, compiling it for the Quark 1000 under Yoctu and away you go. Um, the point being though that this is acting as an aggregator and um, basically a control and reporting kind of station that can be used locally if needed, has its own web interface, but can also publish and subscribe to a higher level service and act as the um, hub for all of your um, edge devices. Um, and another word for that, of course, gets back to IoT Gateway, which is what its primary use is. But if you want, and as, a, and as an educational tool, if you want to also have um, local I.O. on here, you can do that. That's one of the reasons why the Arduino header was put on here, is so that you can actually add your own devices. But if you want to maintain the CEUL certification when you do that, for instance, you might want to enhance the basic product with something of your own and then resell it, then you would have to get it recertified. But there is one easy solution right now that Siemens has provided for everybody, and that is they have an IoT uh, I.O. shield for this board that plugs directly into the Arduino R3 headers. Um, and this in itself, along with the IoT 2000 boards, maintains the CEUL certification. So you put these two together, it gives you full 24 volt compliant digital inputs, outputs, um, analog inputs, etc., that are all able to work with the industrial specifications for the 24 volts. Um, you can drive relays and things like that without concern. Um, you know, 0 to 10 volts, analog, 4 to 20 milliamps are all very, very easy to implement using this. And because it's got the certification, you could put that in here, add your application to it, and still be able to resell it and not worry about the hardware certifications for UL and CE and things like that. You can just um, go right off and do it. And it comes with a really cool um, replacement bezel. The original one has a, uh, where is it? Here it is. The original one comes with a basic cover that goes over the digital I.O. Um, R3 headers. But of course, you know, you cut that if you want to for, for a, a prototype. But once you're done, the STL files the, and the step files are available for the cover um, so that you can expand it um, to suit any I.O. that you might make. But if you're using the Siemens Industrial Shield, then it is already coming with one right off the bat so that you just clip it in and it provides a very nice, neat interface for you to do um, your project with. There's no you know, extra things you have to do. Just plug it all together, wire it up, and away you go. Aside from, of course, adding your Node-RED and things like that, or whatever language you like. You know, I'm, I like Node-RED, I like using MQTT, and I like using SQLite 3. They're easy to use, and I can use them across a huge number of different uh, platforms, including Raspberry Pi, BeagleBones, uh, in a lot of cases, even 
um, with uh, the Ardu some of the Arduinos and things like that, all right? And you can run it on a PC, and you can also configure it to communicate with a lot of the cloud services very, very easily. So one of the first things I always do with any Linux-based kind of um, control, whether it be a gateway or an edge device, is I look to see if I can put on MQTT, Node-RED, and all that kind of stuff. And that's one of the benchmark acceptance things, you know, where it starts to get the thumbs up if it can support all those. When the IoT 2000 first came out, a lot of those things weren't available, and it was quite tedious to try and get them on. But Siemens has worked very hard over the um, six months or so that this product has been out to include all of those things on the image by default. So they're there for you. You just turn them on and start using them, which is great. The IoT 2020 is a little bit slower, not in actual CPU power, but in uh, perceived performance, only because it's got the half a gigabyte of RAM versus a full one gig. And really, the only time you notice this is if you're trying to do any um, app get updates, up you know, app get install kind of commands, or OPKG, I guess, in the case of the um, Yocto um, OS, where you have to update and, and recompile and things. And when you start to compile and stuff like that, it does take a little longer on the uh, version with the smaller uh, RAM footprint. But that's just a one-time thing while you're doing the compilation. Once it's done, I've really found that uh, neither of them perform any better um, in day-to-day -day operations running MQTT and Node-RED and stuff like that. They both, uh, you wouldn't really remotely, if you're using a UI, really t easily tell the difference between them. So, you know, as a gateway device, it works very well. It's very open and it's got a lot of possibilities for uh, integrating a whole bunch of different pieces of equipment together and then reporting up to this um, parent system, whether it be um, a computer that's on the other side of the world, whether it could be a, um, a maintenance company looking after a huge uh, fleet of uh, construction equipment, for example. And on that note, if you look at the um, contest that we just recently ran on Haxa.io, uh, the, the prize winning entry was actually uh, a monitoring system for a bulldozer type piece of plant equipment that used an IoT 2020 as a gateway. Um, LoRa wi wireless communications and other peripherals to allow a system to be put together to provide preventative maintenance, um, asset tracking, so GPS location and things like that, all built around an IoT 2020, not, not just the 2040, but just the educational 2020. Um, uh, very well put together, a huge amount of detail there that shows you one of the possibilities that you could do with this. The second prize winner on Hacks at IO had a completely different um, project that they pre that he presented, which was using a boiler system, so monitoring water levels and things like that. Now, in, in this case, there was also uh, auxiliary devices being used, processors and things, to complete the solution. And again, this is showing where the IoT 2020 is more being used as a gateway versus an edge device. Can it be used as an edge device? Yes. It, are there better ways of doing edge devices? Yes, too. All right, you can use it, and you know it's not too much of an expensive way, and it is already uh, certified for industrial and, and ready to go. So it can be um, certainly for small quantities a quick solution to doing an edge device or something that's doing direct I/O. But it's primarily aimed at being the gateway device. So if you don't need the RS232 um, or the second Ethernet port, or you know if you and if you're not really really memory intensive then the 2020 will work quite happily, not just in the educational environment, but in an industrial environment too. If you really need the RS-485, RS-232 ports, and the second Ethernet, um, then the 2040 would be the device for you to choose for that. But there's nothing to stop you putting an IO shield on the 2020 to give you um, an RS-485 port if you want. It's easy enough. And you may, you know, if you're using it yourself, you may not have to get it recertified. But if you're going to be selling it as a product, then a lot of countries you will have to recertify it. Now, the other thing, if you look at the two contests on Haxa.io, is that they both had LCD displays also hooked up to the IoT 2020. And that is very, very easy to do because the IO Shield has the support for um, LCD displays um, on shields already, et cetera, et cetera. In, um, 
both cases, though, they were just simply using either the I2C bus or the SPI bus and wired down to the GPIO outputs of the 2020 to do that. Uh, and they just created their own um, 3D printed uh, replacement lids that the LCD shields fitted on. And it was a very, very nice solution. And that's one of the reasons why they were both picked um, for, the, for the winners. A very extensive, very well um, documented and good examples of using these devices. So when you think about you know, uh, using an IoT 2020, its primary use is as a gateway, but it can be used for other things. Um, if you're looking at creating something like an edge device, then as a prototyping tool, you can use it for that. In fact, you could use it as the edge device if you really wanted to. But depending on the quantity and things, so it becomes a cost um, value proposition, then you may choose to go to a simpler, uh, smaller, more power efficient um, edge device that then reports up to something like an IoT 2020, 2040 for then having all the business logic applied and then submitting its data up to some more um, higher level system for control. But anyway, I wanted to explain to you because a lot of people have been asking, you know, what really is an IoT 2020 or what is an IoT 2040? In my relationship with RS Components, um, they sell the 2020 exclusively and uh, it's an aimed primarily at education and things like that. But it can be used because it's already it's fully certified as well, the same as the 2040 in an industrial environment if you don't need those extra pieces of hardware that are on the 2040. Um, it's, you know, it's DIN row mountable and all that other stuff too. So you know, it's very easy to put into a cabinet, but it's just as easy to adapt a little wall wart, uh, 24 volt wall wart or even a 12 volt one um, and plug it in via an adapter to the screw terminals on the back, of the, on the, sorry, back on the top of the unit. Um, little plug in connector on here so that you've got your 24 volts coming in and then you've got um, a system where you're not exposing mains or anything else because you're just plugging a wall ward in. If you're using it in an industrial environment, of course, you'd probably have it on a DIN rail mount rack and be feeding it from a proper 24 volt industrial power supply, which is really what I've got here as well. I've got the Siemens logo. This is one of the brand new power supplies, uh, 24 volts at 1.3 amps, 1.5 amps, 1.3 amps output. So this is actually driving two IoT 2000 units, a 2040 here and a 2020 here. It's driving a um, S7-1200 PLC with two I.O. modules and it's also driving the um, four port, sorry, six port Ethernet hub that I have on here as well. So that little power supply can drive an awful lot of things because most of these devices, the IoT 2000s, they only consume um, 100 to 200 milliamps, depending on how busy you're keeping them uh, under normal operation. So, you know, if you are obviously if you add shields and stuff, that could consume more. But um, you can see that, you know, 100 and odd milliamps for this, 100, 100 here. I'm, I think in total, I'm only using about half the capacity of this logo power supply. So, uh, I, you know, I've got room to add a couple of sensors and things like that to that if I wanted to as well. Or some additional I.O., maybe an LCD display on one of these controllers. And I will be showing in later videos how to do that as well. Um, but anyway, my purpose for this video was to give you an idea of um, what the IoT 2020 and 2040 is aimed at. And that is the gateway of, for IoT type devices. It's a constant, you know, it, it's primary business use is more aimed at a data concentrator, uh, implementing some business logic and making those local decisions and feeding data up. So you can, you know, it's bringing over data in via multiple protocols, multiple types of, uh, in formats, 4 to 20 milliamp, 20 volts, uh, or if you put your own IO on here, whatever else you may want, um, or you'd be adding your own sensors directly into there. So you could be using the ADCs and things um, you could put your status, a little bit of local status on there for some of the local devices, um, hooking up to legacy systems where uh, maybe they don't have any automation, but by adding a vibration sensor or temperature sensors and things allows you to collect extra data for your uh, manufacturing environment or wherever that might be, uh, environmental data that you could feed up to a central system to help you uh, more understand the environment and better maintain your equipment and things like that.
Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to email me or make comments in the comment section. But um, I hope that clarifies a bit on exactly what the IoT 2020 and 2040 is primarily intended for, but also what you can use it for. So I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it informative and uh, speak to you soon. And there'll be more videos coming out in the future uh, where we start using other devices and multi-protocols and driving stepper motors and all sorts of fun things like that. So see you then, bye.